A gust of overpowering rage swept over him. He did not know that he growled, but he growled aloud with a terrible ferocity. For the last time in his life, he allowed passion to usurp cunning and reason. It was because of his great love for John Thornton that he lost his head. The Yee Hats were dancing about the wreckage of the Spruce Bow Lodge when they heard a fearful roaring and saw rushing upon them an animal the like of which they had never seen before. It was Buck, a live hurricane of fury, hurling himself upon them in a frenzy to destroy. He sprang at the foremost man. It was the chief of the Ehats, ripping the throat wide open till the rent jugular spouted a fountain of blood. He did not pause to worry the victim, but ripped in passing with the next bound, tearing wide the throat of a second man. There was no withstanding him. He plunged about in their very midst, tearing, rending, destroying in constant and terrific motion, which defied the arrows they discharged at him. In fact, so inconceivably rapid were his movements, and so closely were the Indians tangled together, that they shot one another with the arrows, and one young hunter, hurling a spear at Buck in midair, drove it through the chest of another hunter with such force that the point broke through the skin of the back and stood out beyond. Then a panic seized the Ehats, and they fled in terror to the woods, proclaiming as they fled the advent of the evil spirit. And truly, Buck was the fiend incarnate, raging at their heels and dragging them down like deer as they raced through the trees. It was a fateful day for the Yeehats. They scattered far and wide over the country, and it was not till a week later, the last of the survivors gathered together in a lower valley and counted their losses. As for Buck, wearying of the pursuit, he returned to the desolate camp. He found Pete, where he had been killed in his blankets in the first moments of surprise. Thornton's desperate struggle was fresh written on the earth, and Buck scented every detail of it to the edge of a deep pool. By the edge, head and forefeet in the water, lay Skeet, faithful to the last. The pool itself, muddy and discolored from the sluice boxes, effectually hid what it contained, and it contained John Thornton for Buck followed his trace into the water from which no trace led away. All day, Buck brooded by the pool or roamed restlessly about the camp. Death, as a cessation of movement, as a passing out and away from the lives of the living, he knew, and he knew John Thornton was dead. It left a great void in him, somewhat akin to hunger, but a void which ached and ached and which food could not fulfill. At times, when he paused to contemplate the carcasses of the Yeehats, he forgot the pain of it, and at such times he was aware of a great pride in himself, a pride greater than any he had yet experienced. He had killed man, the noblest game of all, and he had killed in the face of the law of club and fang. He sniffed the bodies curiously. They had died so easily. It was harder to kill a husky dog than them. They were no match at all, were it not for their arrows and spears and clubs. Thenceforward, he would be unafraid of them, except when they bore in their hands their arrows, spears, and clubs. Night came on, and a full moon rose high over the trees into the sky, lighting the land till it lay bathed in ghostly, ghostly day. And with the coming of the night, brooding and mourning by the pool, Buck became alive to a stirring of the new life in the forest, other than which the Yee Hats had made. He stood up, listening and scenting. From far away drifted a faint, sharp yelp, followed by a chorus of similar sharp yelps. As the moments passed, the yelps grew closer and louder. Again, Buck knew them as things heard in the other world which persisted in his memory. He walked to the center of the open space and listened. It was the call, the many noted call, sounding more luringly and compellingly than ever before. And as never before, he was ready to obey. John Thornton was dead. The last tie was broken. Man and the claims of man no longer bound him. Hunting their living meat as the Yee Hats were hunting it on the flanks of the migrating moose, the wolf pack had at last crossed over from the land of streams and timber and invaded Buck's Valley. Into the clearing where the moonlight streamed, they poured in a silvery flood, and in the center of the clearing stood Buck, motionless as a statue, 
waiting their coming. They were awed, so still and large he stood, and a moment's pause fell, till the boldest one leaped straight for him, like a flash buck struck, breaking the neck. Then he stood, without movement as before, the stricken wolf rolling in agony behind him. Three others tried it in sharp succession, and one after the other they drew back, streaming blood from sh slashed throats or so shoulders. This was sufficient to fling the whole pack forward pell-mell, crowded together, blocked and confused by its eagerness to pull down the prey. Buck's marvelous quickness and agility stood him in good stead. Pivoting on his hind legs and snapping and gnashing, he was everywhere at once, presenting a front which was apparently unbroken, so swiftly did the whirl and guard from side to side. But to prevent them from getting behind him, he was forced back down past the pool and into the creek bed till he brought up against a high gravel bank. He worked along to a right angle in the bank which the men had made in the course of mining, and in this angle he came to bay, protected on three sides and with nothing to do but face the front. And so well did he face it that at the end of half an hour the wolves drew back discomfited, the tongues of all were out and lolling, the white fangs showing cruelly white in the moonlight. Some were lying down with their heads raised and ears pricked forward. Others stood on their feet watching him. And still others were lapping water from the pool. One wolf, long and lean and gray, advanced cautiously in a friendly manner. And Buck recognized the wild brother with whom he had run for a night and a day. He was whining softly, and as Buck whined, they touched noses. Then an old wolf, gaunt and battle-scarred, came forward. Buck writhed his lips into the preliminary of a snarl, but sniffed noses with him. Whereupon the old wolf sat down, pointed nose at the moon, and broke out the long wolf howl. The others sat down and howled, and now the call came to Buck in unmistakable accents. He, too, sat down and howled. This over, he came out of his angle, and the pack crowded around him, sniffing in half-friendly, half-savage manner. The leaders lifted the yelp of the pack and sprang away into the woods. The wolves swung in behind, yelping in chorus, and Buck ran with them, side by side with the wild brother, yelping as he ran. And here may well end the story of Buck. The years were not many when the Yehats noted a change in the breed of wolves, for some were seen with splashes of brown on head and muzzle, and with a rift of white centering down the chest. But more remarkable than this, the Yehats tell of a ghost dog that runs at the head of the pack. They are afraid of this ghost dog, for it has a cunning greater than they, stealing from their camps in fierce winters, robbing their traps, slaying their dogs, and defying their bravest hunters. Nay, the tale grows worse. Hunters there are who failed to return to the camp, and hunters there have been whom their tribesmen found with throats slashed cruelly open and with wolf prints about them in the snow, greater than the prints of any wolf. Each fall when the Yehats follow the movement of the moose, there is a certain valley which they never enter. And women there are who become sad when the world goes over the fire of how the evil spirit came to select that valley for an abiding place. In the summers, there is one visitor, however, to that valley of which the Yehats do not know. It is a great, glorious coated wolf, like and yet unlike all other wolves. He crosses alone from the smiling timberland and comes down into an open space among the trees. Here a yellow stream flows from rotted moosehide sacks and sinks into the ground, with long grasses growing through it and vegetable mold overrunning it and hiding its yellow from the sun. And here he muses for a time, howling once long and mournfully, ere he departs. But he is not always alone. When the long winter nights come on and the wolves follow their meat into the lower valleys, he may be seen running at the head of the pack through the pale moonlight or glimmering borealis, leaping gigantic above his fellows, his great throat a bellow as he sings a song of the younger world, 
which is a song of the pack.